Today we're going to be talking about noise, different types or colors of noise. In a previous video, we covered how one can use noise to generate random gates or triggers using a comparator. And in a future video, I'll be going over some of the many uses of noise uh, within a modular system. But today I thought it might be fun to go through some of the different colors of noise, especially since I have a module that has several different outputs for the different colors of noise uh, and is really useful in that effect. So that is the Steady State Fate Quantum Rainbow 2, which is the best name for a module ever. Uh, so that's by Steady State Fate and WMT, and it... Is pretty straightforward. It has those outputs and it generates noise. So each of them corresponds to a different flavor or color of noise. And the purpose of each different color of noise is that it has a different frequency response. So we're going to be looking at the frequency response with the spectrum analyzer over here. Uh, and because I had extra screen real estate, the oscilloscope output down here. Uh, these are both plugins from the DAW I use called Reaper. I use that for all of my music recording and editing, uh, and the video recording for these videos. So we're going to start at the top of the module output uh, with white noise, which should look something like this. So white noise is supposed to be flat, and you'll see in the frequency response this is relatively flat. There's a little bit of roll-off here at the high end, uh, at the very high end, but that can be expected with sometimes with analog stuff. Uh, there's also going to be a roll-off down here, probably due to the DC blocking in my interface and a couple other places. That's fine, we don't really want DC anyway. Uh, but white noise is equal energy probability, or equal level at every frequency. It's supposed to be flat. Uh, it's supposed to be flat, but we perceive it or hear it as being mostly high-frequency biased, because each octave, and we're sensitive in a logarithmic range, each octave has twice as many frequencies in it as the octave before it. So from 100 to 200, there's only 100 hertz there. Uh, from 200 to 400, obviously there's twice as many. So that's why white noise will typically have a flat response, but sound more high frequency biased. So moving on from there, we'll go to pink noise. Oh, it should be also noted that basically when creating noise, all of them are going to start with white noise. If we have to create pink noise, uh, basically, you're going to be applying a filter, either usually a high-pass or low-pass filter to create the other colors of noise, but they're almost always going to start with um, white noise. So now let's go down to pink noise. This is one of the more interesting noise sources. Uh, this is uh, white noise with a 3 dB per octave, 3 decibel per octave roll-off. So it's going to be a little bit more low-frequency biased. So this is a commonly used test signal. Um, in the world of acoustics, I would use pink noise to calibrate sound intensity probe, uh, which is a specialized measurement instrument. It's used as a test signal on all sorts of acoustic speaker um, and signal processing applications. It's kind of an interesting noise source. If you do some reading up on it, and this is mentioned in Wikipedia and all sorts of places in the manual for the quantum rainbow, this distribution of noise occurs in nature quite a bit. One of my teachers in college poetically called it the noise of the world uh, because in certain landscapes, topology, other applications, electronics, pink noise just seems to exist in nature. So I won't wax poetic here about it, but read up on it. Pink noise is pretty interesting um, and it's a very useful signal. So moving down one more from there, we're going to see red noise. So this is even more aggressively filtered before. This is negative 6 dB per octave as a low-pass filter. And so this is a good low-frequency content noise. Uh, you can see, you can kind of see, well, if, obviously you can see the frequency response and the, the steep roll-off here, but you can also see the difference in the signal. Let's go back up to white noise for a second. Just so, look at the oscilloscope output. You can see the low frequencies based on how it's sp spaced out down here. So that's white noise. Uh, I should also point out that the Quantum Rainbow has trimmer outputs on the back for all of these, uh, which may be slightly out of adjustment. So if the amplitude here changes a little bit, uh, that's because the trimmers might be a little bit off, but the slope should be what we're worried about here. Uh, so this is red noise, uh, low frequency, heavy. Next is an interesting one that I hadn't heard about before. I actually got this module called Gray Noise.
this has an interesting slope because it appears to be the function of both some low-pass filtering and high-pass filtering. And what this is supposed to approximate is the A-weighting filter that gets applied to acoustic measurements that best responds or best represents the human hearing. So a long time ago, two guys named Fletcher and Munson came up with the Fletcher-Munson curves, uh, which indicate that humans are not sensitive to all frequency ranges equally. We're less sensitive to low frequency content and high frequency content, and we're the most sensitive in the range from basically one to four kilohertz. Also interesting to note is that we're most sensitive in this range, and human speech seems to have developed that uh, this is where the most important information in our speech is located. So if you were to filter this out, you would have a really hard time understanding people uh, as far as language goes. But this is where we're most sensitive. And if you were to look at the equal loudness contours, which are the updated Fletcher-Munson cur Fletcher curves, you'll see that, that sensitivity as it goes sensitivity goes down so that more energy is needed at low frequency content and high frequency content. If you were to take one of the middle curves around uh, the 50 decibel line and inverted it, you would have the A-weighted filter and that gets applied to almost every acoustic measurement that gets made for commercial purposes. Uh, it's the filter I use when making noise measurements at work. Um, it's not necessarily always the most appropriate curve. There are other curves. Um, there's A, B, C, D, and E-weighting curves and uh, they all have different applications for different loudness. The A-weighted curve gets used a whole lot, even when it's not, like I said, the most appropriate, but it's also the most flattering for noise figures, so that's why pretty much every, every uh, manufacturer of a good that gets noise rated will do it via the A-weighting curve. But I digest. Below that we have blue noise. So this has a high pass filter applied to it at minus or plus 3 dB per octave. So you can see it's mostly high frequency content and the low frequency gets rolled off. And then below that we have purple or violet noise. And this is even more aggressively filtered. So this will be plus 6 dB per octave. And this would be useful for doing some kind of cymbal or hi-hat work and um, other high frequency content stuff. And then finally, we have one of the more interesting ones. This is the quanta output. Now, this can look quite a bit different uh, depending on how you have that trimmer in the back arranged. Now, the frequency response is kind of flat, but now look at the oscilloscope output. You get these kind of pulse outputs. You, it, it's almost like the crackling from vinyl. And what's neat is these, these are a good source of random triggers. Um, the way they describe it in the manual is that they're quantizing the values to a certain range um, from randomly generated noise. Uh, I'm the least familiar with this one, uh, but it's an interesting noise output. It's, it's non-traditional. It certainly doesn't look like any of these others, which have, um, you know, have a very broad frequency response that's almost all-encompassing, just slightly tailored. So those are just a couple different colors of noise, a couple different flavors of noise. Uh, like I said, in a future video, we'll be going through a whole bunch of applications of noise um, and how you can get the most use out of them. If you're ever bored and you want to listen to noise, I recommend pink noise. It's probably, it can be fatiguing after a while and sometimes at work or if I really want to focus on something, I might listen to pink noise. Uh, but uh, they're all pretty cool and I would highly recommend just taking noise and inserting it and blending it with different signals to seeing what impact it has on both control voltage and audio. Hopefully this was helpful.